In the 149th year, word came to Judas and his men that Antiochus Eupator was coming with the great army against Judea, and with him Lysias, his guardian, who had charge of the government. Each of them had a Greek force of 110,000 infantry, 5,300 cavalry, 22 elephants, and 300 chariots armed with scythes. Menelaus also joined them, and with utter hypocrisy urged Antiochus on, not for the sake of his country's welfare, but because he thought that he would be established in office. But the king of kings aroused the anger of Antiochus against the scoundrel. And when Lysias informed him that this man was to blame for all the trouble, he ordered them to take him to Baroia and to put him to death by the method which is the custom in that place. For there is a tower in that place, fifty cubits high, full of ashes, and it has a rim running around it, which on all sides inclines precipitously into the ashes. There they all push to, to destruction any man guilty of sacrilege or notorious for other crimes. By such a fate it came about that Menelaus the lawbreaker died without even burial in the earth. And this was eminently just, because he had committed many sins against the altar, whose fire and ashes were holy. He met his death in ashes. The king with barbarous arrogance was coming to show the Jews things far worse than those that had been done in his father's time. But when Judas heard of this, he ordered the people to call upon the Lord day and night, now if ever to help those who were on the point of being deprived of the law and their country and the holy temple, and not to let the people who had just begun to revive fall into the hands of the blasphemous Gentiles. When they had all joined in the same petition, and had begged the merciful Lord with weeping and fasting and lying prostrate for three days without ceasing, Judas exhorted them and ordered them to stand ready. After consulting privately with the elders, he determined to march out and decide the matter by the help of God before the king's army could enter Judea and get possession of the city. So committing the decision to the creator of the world and exhorting his men to fight nobly to the death for the laws, temple, city, country, and commonwealth, he pitched his camp near Modean. He gave his men the watchword, God's victory. And with a picked force of the bravest young men, he attacked the king's pavilion at night and slew as many as 2,000 men in the camp. He stabbed the leading elephant and its rider. In the end, they filled the camp with terror and confusion and withdrew in triumph. This happened just as day was dawning because the Lord's help protected him. The king, having had a taste of the daring of the Jews, tried strategy in attacking their positions. He advanced against Bethsur, a strong fortress of the Jews, was turned back, attacked again, and was defeated. Judas sent into the garrison whatever was necessary. But Rodacus, a man from the ranks of the Jews, gave secret information to the enemy. He was sought for, caught, and put in prison. The king negotiated a second time with the people in Beth Zur, gave pledges, received theirs, withdrew, attacked Judas and his men, and was defeated. He got word that Philip, who had been left in charge of the government, had revolted in Antioch. He was dismayed, called in the Jews, yielded and swore to observe all their rights, settled with them, and offered sacrifice, honored the sanctuary, and showed generosity to the holy place. He received Maccabeus, left Hegemonides as governor from Ptolemais to Gerar, and went to Ptolemais. The people of Ptolemais were indignant over the treaty. In fact, they were so angry that they wanted to annul its terms. Lysias took the public platform, made the best possible defense, convinced them, appeased them, gained their goodwill, and set out for Antioch. This is how the king's attack and withdrawal turned out. Three years later, word came to Judas and his men that Demetrius, the son of Seleucus, had sailed into the harbor of Tripolis with a strong army and a fleet and had taken possession of the country, having made away with Antiochus and his guardian Lysias. Now a certain alchemist, who had formerly been high priest but had willfully defiled himself in the times of separation, realized that there was no way for him to be safe or to have access again to the holy altar, and, when, and went to King Demetrius in about the 151st year, 
presenting to him a crown of gold and a palm, and besides these some of the customary olive branches from the temple. During that day he kept quiet, but he found an opportunity that furthered his mad purpose when he was invited by Demetrius to a meeting of the council and was asked about the disposition and intentions of the Jews. He answered, Those of the Jews who are called Hasidians, whose leader is Judas Maccabeus, are keeping up war and stirring up sedition, and will not let the kingdom attain tranquility. Therefore I have laid aside my ancestral glory, I mean the high priesthood, and have now come here, first because I am genuinely concerned for the interests of the king, and second because I have regard also for my fellow citizens. For through the folly of those whom I have mentioned, our whole nation is now in no small misfortune. Since you are acquainted, O king, with the details of this matter, deign to take thought for our country and our hard-pressed nation with the gracious kindness which you show to all. For as long as Judas lives, it is impossible for the government to find peace. When he had said this, the rest of the king's friends, who were hostile to Judas, quickly inflamed Demetrius still more. And he immediately chose Nicanor, who had been in command of the elephants, appointed him governor of Judea, and sent him off with orders to kill Judas and scatter his men, and to set up alchemists as high priest of the great temple. And the Gentiles throughout Judea, who had fled before Judas, flocked to join Nicanor, thinking that the misfortunes and calamities of the Jews would mean prosperity for themselves. When the Jews heard of Nicanor's coming and the gathering of the Gentiles, they sprinkled dust upon their heads and prayed to him who established his own people forever and always, uphold his own heritage by manifesting himself. At the command of the leader, they set out from there immediately and engaged them in battle at a village called Dessa. Simon, the brother of Judas, had encountered Nicanor, but had been temporarily checked because of the sudden consternation created by the enemy. Nevertheless, Nicanor, hearing of the valor of Judas and his men, and their courage in battle for their country, shrank from deciding the issue by bloodshed. Therefore he sent Poseidonus, and Theodotus, and Mattathias to give and receive pledges of friendship. When the terms had been fully considered, and the leader had informed the people, and it had appeared that they were of one mind, they agreed to the covenant. And the leaders set a day on which to meet by themselves. A chariot came forward from each army. Seats of honor were set in place. Judas posted army men, armed men in readiness at key places to prevent sudden treachery on the part of the enemy. They held the proper conference. Nicanor stayed on in Jerusalem and did nothing out of the way, but dismissed the flocks of people that had gathered. And he kept Judas always in his presence. He was warmly attached to the man, and he urged him to marry and have children. So he married, settled down, and shared the common life. Where has your beloved gone, O fairest among women? Where has your beloved turned, that we may seek him with you? My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to pasture his flock in the gardens, and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He pastures his flock among the lilies. You are beautiful as Terza, my love, comely as Jerusalem. Terrible as an army with banners. Turn away your eyes from me, for they disturb me. Your hair is like a flock of goats, moving down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes, that have come up from the washing. All of them bear twins. Not one of them is bereaved. Your cheeks are like halves of pomegranate behind your veil. There are sixty queens and eighty concubines, and maidens without number. My dove, my perfect one, is only one the darling of her mother, flawless to her that bore her. The maidens saw her and called her happy, the queens and concubines also, and they praised her. Who is this that looks forth like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army with banners? I went down to the nut orchard to look at the blossoms of the valley, to see whether the vines had budded, whether the pomegranates were in bloom, before I was aware, my fancy set me in a chariot beside my prince. Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. Why should you look upon the Shulamite as upon a dance before two armies? 
How graceful are your feet and sandals, O queenly maiden! Your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a master hand. Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat, encircled with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are pools in Heshbon, by the gate of Bathrabim. Your nose is like a tower of Lebanon, overlooking Damascus. Your head crowns you like Carmel, and your flowing locks are like purple. A king is held captive in its tresses. How fair and pleasant you are, O loved one, delectable maiden. You are stately as a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its branches. O oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine, and the scent of your breath like apples. That goes down smoothly, gliding over lips and teeth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice come from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without price from the fountain of the water of life. He who conquers shall have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, as for murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot shall be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then came out of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And in the spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance, like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its breadth. And he measured the city with his rod, twelve thousand stadia. Its length and breadth and height are equal. He also measured its wall, a hundred and forty-four cubits, by a man's measure, that is, an angel's. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, chrysophase the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelfth and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it, and its gates shall never be shut by day, and there shall be no night there. They shall bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations." 
but nothing unclean shall enter it, nor any one who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. In the second to last scene of Revelation, St. John sees a new heaven and a new earth. Most people miss the detail, and in missing it, they misunderstood where much of eternal life is spent. Indeed, much popular imagination is that at the end, we will be raptured up to heaven, leaving behind earth forever. Many may well be surprised at what John sees at the end, heaven coming down to earth. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. To empathize this point, God declares, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. The second coming is like the first. God comes to us. The earth matters, and it will remain our home. At the same time, it will be put through a major renovation, as God declares, Behold, I make all things new. In the renewed earth, there is no place for evil, and therefore God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be no mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Are these hope-filled words and images imprinted deeply in your imagination and heart?